Well, if you would open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 5. Just been thoroughly enjoying walking through this book as a church. It's just packed with exciting stories and narratives. And as we've mentioned many times, these are not just mere history. They're history with a theological point. They're history with an intention to change us. It's the goal of Acts is not just that we would know our Christian history. It's that we would allow that Christian history, which is divine revelation, to change us and shape us in very specific ways. This is not just a history lesson. It's a transformation moment every time we open the book of Acts. It has transformative power for us. So we're going to read a, a somewhat lengthy passage, chapter 5, verse 12 to the end of the chapter. Kind of, kind of two stories that we're going to lump together into one sermon. One is a snapshot of some powerful signs and wonders being done through the hands of the apostles. And then the reaction to those signs and wonders and the growing popularity of the church in the second half of the chapter. So sort of two stories that we're going to push together into a sermon. But let's begin reading in Acts 5, chapter 12. Let, let's enjoy the reality that the early church experienced and that is still theologically relevant for us this morning. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now, when the high priest came in and those who were with him, they called together the council and all the senate of the people of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men. Let them alone. For if this plan or if this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, 
You will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. I love the book of Acts. It's just inspired, powerful, transforming truth. It's very important when we read a narrative that we, first of all, don't assume, as I said earlier, it's not mere history. Check, I know that happened. I remember this story. No, it, it's not mere history, but nor is it the same kind of biblical genre as, say, the book of Romans, which gives you very direct theological truth. So we have to ask the question, what truth... What motivating, transforming, life-shaping truth is this story intending to bring to us? And it takes a little bit of effort to examine that because it's possible to get it wrong. For example, if you had a preacher stand up, preach that story and say, God's people will never linger long in prison. Acts chapter 5 proves it. (laughs) Wrong point. You missed the point. Or... God's people are only the true people of God if they are experiencing daily miraculous healings. No, wrong point. You missed the point. Or, God's people will always experience visible victory over the people that persecute them within a 24-hour period. No, that's missing the point. So we we have to learn to study what point is the passage making that is not contradicted by other scriptures, but rather complements them and brings to us a unique and powerful lesson from this particular story. Here's the point I think that's being made. You see if this, this sort of resonates with you as you read that passage. God will reveal his power in the advance of his gospel despite the rage of his enemies. Does that resonate with you as you read this passage? It's important to me that it would because I don't want us to get used as a church just because somebody stands up in a stage and just declares, now here's what, here's what the Bible's teaching us today, that we just say, okay, sounds good. He knows what he's talking about and he has the microphone. He must be right. No, that's, it should resonate with your soul. It should be like, yeah, that's, that's the main point that I would see in that scripture. That, that would be how I would summarize. What, what I do every week is I just study the passage and I try to first come up with what, what's, a, what's a sentence that would summarize the main transforming point of this passage. And that's the one I came up with this week. God will reveal his power in the advance of his gospel despite the rage of his enemy. So if you put it negatively, rage against the gospel will not stop the power of God from moving it forward. That's the summary of this passage. Let me break down these kind of two stories, two snapshots into three points, okay? The first one is this one, supernatural power. Supernatural power, that's that's what's going on in verse 12 through 16. It says, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. They were all together in Solomon's portico, apparently a part of the temple. None of the rest dared join them. We don't know whether that means all the rest of the Christians. There were some maybe fearful Christians, or is that referring to the rest of the people that were scared to join them? So we're not quite sure, but apparently this is such a tense environment that some group of people is unwilling to be there because of the risk and the obviously opposition of the leaders. But the point is, is the apostles are there and they are preaching and they are healing people with remarkable regularity. And the people, that would be the general people in Jerusalem, seem to hold them in high esteem. No wonder. I mean, these guys, when you, when you bring sick people to them, the sick people leave and they're healed. And this is happening consistently, regularly. And if you remember what they prayed the last time they were captured by the high priest was that God would affirm the testimony of his word by stretching out his hand to heal. So this is a direct answer to that prayer. Remember they they left the former time they were seized by the high priest and they said, Lord, stretch out your hand to heal and confirm your word. Well, he's doing it. He is doing it. Actually, so much so that people are beginning to believe in the Lord. It said multitudes of both men and women in verse 14 believe in the Lord. 
And there's such a, a faith now, an expectation that God's power is present in these apostles, the leaders of this church, this new community of Jesus, that they're even carrying, it says, the sick into the streets and laying them on cots and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall on them. Back in those days, the shadow would have been perceived at some level as an extension of the person. They're saying, look, just, just let them touch Peter's shadow. They'll be healed. Grandma's got a fever. Take her to the street. Let Peter pass by the shadow. Let's put the sun, like contrary to the sun, let Peter walk and then she'll be healed. Incredible power is being displayed. Transparently supernatural power. This is supernatural power at work. It says it, they brought the sick and those afflicted even with unclean spirits. So these would have been demon possessed at some level. People that are overcome by the power of a demonic activity. And they bring those and, and they're healed. All of it, them, it says, are healed. And people are getting saved because of God's testimony to his power. Multitudes, it says. Now remember, they already had... 3,000 and then 2,000 saved. So th this is a thousands and thousands of people. And now it says multitudes. Th this is the ultimate church growth moment, okay? I mean, signs and wonders, people are being healed. Just the shadow passing over, people are being recovering. It's incredible supernatural power. Now, the point of this is not that no Christian will ever be sick. As we see in the Bible, good, godly people are sick. The point is, God is able to attend the advance of his gospel with power. Sometimes he does it by, does it by healing people. I pray he would do that in our church. And we believe that God heals people today. I pray he would give testimony to the power of his word by healing the sick and raising up those who are afflicted and, and, and reversing any kind of demonic activity in our community. Yes, I absolutely would pray for that. For the glory of the advance of his gospel. Because God's power is advancing his gospel. And often it bears witness to it when supernatural things take place that cannot be explained by any human means. It only can point to God bearing testimony to the message of Jesus Christ. So we pray for that. So this supernatural power is taking place. That's in some ways, that's a kind of a conclusion or, or maybe a, a transition from all that's been happening. It's a snapshot. But we also see its connection, its connection to the next section because it seems that this popularity and this overwhelming revival that's taking place is not producing joy in the parts of the religious leaders. They are seeing their place replaced. So supernatural power is at work, but then we move on to the second section, confounded enemies. That's how I would caption this next section from verse 17 and, and following right up until they re-arrest them. It's, it's sort of a, a, the first arrest, you might call it. There's this first arrest and a deliverance, and then there's a second arrest and then the, another deliverance. So it's kind of, you can think of this second story in those two ways. There's sort of two arrests. There's an arrest and a deliverance, and then there's arrest and another kind of deliverance. To arrest, right? I would, I would call this first one confounded opposition. I, I like the word confounded. I, I was thinking about it this week, and I looked it up, and one definition, I, you, you don't, we don't use the word confounded very often, um, but to confound, one definition says, to cause surprise or confusion in someone, especially by acting against their expectations. They were utterly confounded, you might say. To cause surprise or confusion in someone, especially by acting against their expectations. It could also be used to prove a prediction wrong. <laughs> to defeat a plan, an aim, or a hope, or an archaic use to overthrow an enemy. I thought, well, that's the perfect word for what's happening in this first arrest. The opposition is confounded. It says in verse 17 that the high priest rises up and all who are with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and they were filled. You want to notice when it says they were filled with jealousy. It's, it's it probably a contrast. The times they're filled with anger, filled with jealousy, filled with rage. With the church, which is filled with the spirit. They're filled with jealousy. They're filled with jealousy and they arrest the apostles again and put them in public prison. So they drag them into prison. Peter and apparently all the apostles this time, not just two of them. So this is kind of an escalation from the previous interaction with just Peter and John. All of them now. They're put in the public prison. 
But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, brings them out, and says, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people the words of this life. Worth noting, I don't think the main point of the passage, but worth noting the courage and instantaneous obedience by faith of the apostles as an example for all Christians for all time. We were just arrested. Go right back. Right back there. Stand there. Be there when people show up in the morning. I want you there early. I want your faces to be the first things they see. I want you preaching before they have time for their morning bagel. I want you right there before anything else happens. I want them to see you preaching. And they do. Yes. Yes, Lord. We're right there. They're delivered by this angel. And you have to enjoy. God has a sense of humor. Now, it is deadly. But the church and God's people throughout the ages are supposed to enjoy and be sobered by his humor when it comes to confounding his enemies. So there, there should be this combination of it's sobering because they're messing with God, but it's supposed to be humorous. You're supposed to chuckle a bit at this story. So here they are, and, and they're taken out of prison, and they're pla planted right back in the temple, and then apparently the entire Sanhedrin comes, the entire council. It says, there, you see there, down there in verse 21, second half of verse 21, the entire council, all the Senate of the people of Israel. So they, they have a major trial. This is going to be a big, they brought in everybody. Nobody absent. This isn't just a quorum meeting. You've all got to be here. They're all lined up, representatives apparently in some level, and the teachers and the leaders, Gamaliel, highly respected apparently is there. I mean, this is the big dogs are present. And we are going to crush this thing once and for all. So they all show up. You imagine there's a sense of the, the, the foolish, almost the clownishness of the scene. There's this huge dignified Sanhedrin and all that we have them in jail. And you feel that we've got it all set up, all the tables, people in their proper place. Now, bring them in. You, you can feel the, the, the kind of silliness. And as the reader, you're supposed to be chuckling. They're supposed to be kind of like, oh, this is going to be good. You're supposed to feel that. That's the point of the, the way this passage works. This is going to be good. All these dignified people. Now go bring those apostles from the jail cell. Those poor, helpless apostles that we will now evaluate. So the, the, the messenger comes back and delivers what had to have been an incredibly awkward message for this dignified gathering. <laughs> Imagine, I mean, this is like some poor administrative soldier and he's trying to be helpful. He's trying to be as specific as he can be, but the more things he says, the more embarrassing it becomes. Okay, here's, here's the situation. <laughs> We found the prison, it's locked. So let's just be clear, this wasn't my fault, okay? The prison is locked. And not only is it locked, the guards are standing at the door. The guards are standing at the door. And when we opened them, nobody was in there. We found no one inside. I love the understated humor of the end of verse 24. They were greatly perplexed about these words, wondering what this would come to. You can feel the awkward, like, you know, there they are, and they're kind of looking at each other like, um, okay, we've gathered everybody. This doesn't look good. They're not there. Where could they be? The doors were locked. The guards are there. This is this whole trial. The whole Senate is gathered now. Do we dismiss? Where are they? This is, we've gathered everybody. What are we going to do? Then it gets worse. The messenger runs back and says, someone came in and says, the men, can't feel the dignity. All these people, all these dignitaries, they're right there. They're sitting there wondering, well, how, okay, well, what would you do? They're not there. The prisoners are locked, guards are standing there. They're not inside. They were there last night, they're not there anymore. Where are they? Then some guy comes running in. Those guys that you arrested, they're in the temple and they're teaching all the people. They're not in the prison. They're in the temple where you dragged them from and they're teaching all the people. And then you feel the, the further irony. It says the captain of the guard goes to get them, but he is so transparently aware of the popularity of these men that God has given them and the, the favor that they're currently in with the crowd of Israelites. Obviously, they've been healing everybody. No wonder they're in favor. That the soldier himself is unwilling to aggressively approach them anymore. He has to sort of gently request, would you, would you please, you know, we have a, 
a little meeting here. Would you be willing to come? It's almost like he has to come by invitation a bit. Now who's the dignitary at the dignified meeting? Would, would you be willing? I, I don't want to. Sorry, guys. I know you've... Oh, that looks like a bad wound. Uh, they'll be back in a moment. Um, I'm sorry your child is coughing badly, but we, we, will, we just need a, just, just a second. Just a second. Just wait here. And you feel all of a sudden these powerful people are put in the position of sort of timid, requesting. Would, would, you, would you mind coming with... We, we don't mean to offend anybody, but would you mind coming with us? Not by force. Because they were afraid of being stoned by the people. Stoned. You feel the reversal. Remember we talked about this before? God uses these stories to, to teach. Look, what appears to be the case is not actually the case. The people who appear to be in power are not actually in power. The enemies are confounded. Remember, I like that word. To cause surprise or confusion in someone, especially by acting against their expectations. Definitely. To prove a theory or prediction wrong. Definitely. To defeat a plan, an aim, or a hope. Definitely to overthrow an enemy. Definitely. What is God's power doing in the proclamation of his gospel? He's always doing this. He's always confounding his enemies. Now, the point of reading a narrative is not to say he'll do it exactly this way, that there's always going to be an angel, it's always going to be 24 hours. The point is, in the scope of history and in his own ways, God is always confounding his enemies by pushing the gospel forward. He is always going to do this. The gospel is always going to confound the enemies of God. He's always going to defeat them. He's always going to undermine their expectations. He's always going to disallow them from accomplishing their ultimate ends. He's always going to do that. That's what the gospel is doing. It's pressing forward to the consternation of its enemies because everything they do seems to be helpless and worthless. Confounded enemies. There's a lot we could meditate on there in terms of God's power to laugh at those who rage against him. This is a Psalm 2 recreation. The enemies gather together. They say, let's cast aside these ropes of deity. We will not serve him anymore in the king in heaven. He laughs at them. Your guards can't even see an angel opening the doors, letting people out, relocking them and leaving. So they bring them in. They re-arrest them gently. And they bring them, it says in verse 27, and set them before the council. This leads to the third point this morning, a surprising perspective. There's actually a series of surprising perspectives. And in those perspectives, we see this same point being made. It says they, they set them before them. They speak to them and say, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So the first thing we, we want to notice that's a sort of surprising perspective here is that these men seem unwilling to acknowledge the power of God obviously on display in Peter and John, the other apostles. They're, they're unwilling. They don't even reference that. They don't reference the healing. You notice that no mention, zero mention is made of their deliverance from prison. They just conveniently skip entirely over that. They don't even ask, how did you get out of prison? I mean, it's almost like they had a pack going in. Nobody says nothing. They come in, it's as though it was the whole plan all along. All right? They come in, we strictly charge you. As though these guys just haven't experienced a miraculous deliverance from prison. They haven't been healing people all week long. Just skip right over it. So surprising the level of blindness that is present in these men, that all they care about is their own reputation. Also surprising that they are deeply concerned when they say, you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now, I don't think they're, they're denying that they actually crucified Jesus. They're not that blind. But I think what they're saying is, you intend to treat us as though doing that was wrong. You intend to treat us as though we're guilty for doing that. You intend to treat us as though we uh, killed innocent blood. So it, it, is, it continues to be surprising that their, their blindness is such that in spite of all that Jesus was and all of his innocence, they are determined to see him as guilty and themselves as innocent. They're determined so there's a surprising blindness in their perspective. Then Peter 
Second surprising perspective, Peter reverses it and says, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree, and God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Here's why this is surprising. From a... Cultural expectation. What Peter just said about Jesus and God the Holy Spirit is culturally shocking. And we don't want to get familiar with it just because Peter is insisting on making this point every time he gets up in front of people. He keeps at the same nail. We can, we can say it this way. Peter is determined to make one point and one point only over and over again in the book of Acts. And the point is Jesus Christ is the Messiah. The crucified one is the risen one is the Messiah. Let me say it again. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. You are responsible for his death, but it was God's plan. God raised him up. Yes, he was cursed under the punishment of the cross, but ultimately God raised him up and you must repent and believe in him. Peter is repetitive. Peter is determined. As he says in his epistle, it is good for me to say the same things to you as a reminder. It is good for you. So he tells them again. But we don't want to grow familiar with the scandal of the cross. It is scandalous. It is scandalous that God's Holy One died on a cross. It is scandalous. It is not what should happen. It is surprising. And we need to ask, are we still surprised by this? Are we captured by this to the point that that's the main point we would make in a moment like that? Are we captured by the fact that God's Holy One was crucified on a cross and that the result of that event was the offer of forgiveness and repentance even stated to those who were culpable for his crucifixion? Very important that we we appreciate when Peter weaves these truths together, cross, forgiveness, redemption, he's saying in a sort of narrative way what Paul teases out in his letters about atonement and the death of Christ being substitutionary and the result of that death being forgiveness and the possibility of repentance and the raising of Jesus being the extension of that offer to anyone who will believe in him. It's a wonderful thing. So to to use a couple of of quotes to make this point. G.B. Carrot says, Surely no Christian preacher would have chosen to describe the death of Jesus in terms which drew attention to the curse of God resting upon the executed criminal unless he had faced the scandal of the cross and had come to believe that Jesus had borne the curse on behalf of others. David Peterson says this, To Jewish ears, especially in light of Deuteronomy 21-23, which says that anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse, it would have highlighted the shameful nature of Jesus' death and suggested its penal character. Here's the point. Peter is not ashamed of the cross. He continues to bring it up, to point it out. In other words, he doesn't see for some reason the cross as embarrassing for Jesus so much as embarrassing for the people who put him there. It's a surprising perspective. He doesn't see the cross as embarrassing or something to be hidden about Jesus, but something to be proclaimed. And what these commentators are saying is it's because he sees the cross as an essential part of God's plan, though it was perpetrated by sinful people. Jesus bore on the cross the curse of God poured out on his head in place of sinners. And here's the result. God has exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior. Leader and savior, the cursed one has become leader and savior. And we know quite clearly from the rest of the New Testament that those two things can't be separated. The reason he is leader and savior is because he bore the curse of God on that tree for you and me if you believe in Jesus. He is leader and savior because he can rescue sinners who have no chance of approaching God. God because of their own reputation and record of sin. But when that record was placed on Jesus and Jesus absorbed the full weight of it, then he can be exalted and he can rescue anyone who believes in him because the full penalty for their sin was exalted in his soul on that tree. And Peter is preaching this. 
Once again, the reality is the opposite of the appearance. Who is on trial yet again? It's the Sanhedrin. It's anybody who will reject Jesus because Jesus is God's leader and savior. And everyone must repent and believe in him. Only in him is there forgiveness of sins. Only in him is there salvation. Only in him is there hope for God's people. Only in him can people find ultimate redemption. Jesus and Jesus alone is the only hope. And the fact that Peter proclaims this in the presence of his crucifiers is an expression of the incredible mercy of God. Once again, he is pointing out their sin, but he's not communicating to them un, a, a lack of any hope for their own redemption. He's saying, look, there is one in whom there is forgiveness and repentance. David Peterson, again, helpful to hear how he comments on this. He said, even as Peter uttered these words, the offer of salvation was once more extended to those who condemned Jesus to death. The offer of forgiveness makes genuine repentance possible. Jesus, the rejected and crucified Messiah, had died and been raised so as to give repentance and forgiveness to Israel. This remarkable paradox expresses the incredible grace of God towards all who set themselves against him and his anointed one. This is Peter's message. Surprising perspective. Surprise, the crucified one is the anointed Savior. Surprise, even sinners can repent and believe in him. Surprise... The one you rejected is the only one that can save you. Surprise! Surprising perspective again. But the surprising perspective continues because instead of being softened by this truth, they are hardened. Verse 33, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. Perfect example of what Paul says, that the, the proclamation of Christ is sweet to some and odorous. To others. It smells like life to some. It smells like death to others. It's worth, even as Christians, professing Christians, to examine in our souls how does it smell to us? Just to be here in a church, it's worth asking the question when I say Jesus Christ is the only source of salvation, you must believe in Him, but if you do, you can be saved. What does that smell like? Life? Yes, amen, or death. I don't want to hear that again. And if you're here and you're not a believer and your reaction at some point in your soul is more like this Sanhedrin where it's, it's, I don't want to hear that again. That was their reaction. I don't want to hear that again. Enough about Jesus. I don't want to hear that again. It's worth repenting of that hardness of heart and coming to him. Your dislike of Jesus does not dethrone him. It means that you need him more than ever. Your dislike of Jesus doesn't minimize his ability to save you. It means you need to call out to him more than ever. So if you feel in your heart that resistance, that tug away from Jesus when I say that about him, please fight your own heart and and come to him, respond to the mercy that he offers. Their rage is extreme. They will not fight it. They will indulge it. Actually, the word... Uh, the, the phrase here, one of the words, it, it, it refers to being split open in rage. That they're torn apart by their anger. And they want to kill them. So here we have another moment where potentially you could see the world the wrong side up. Those that seem to have power are enraged and they want to kill them. You you should hear echoes of the rage expressed at Jesus. This trial, a lot of trials and acts, they're a lot like a reproduction of what happened to him. And that's intentional because the church functions in continuity with its Lord. They're split open in rage. They want to kill them. But then, surprise again... Salvation, temporally speaking, comes from an unexpected place. A a leading teacher named Gamaliel stands up. He has Peter and John, the rest of the apostles, put outside. And then he begins to give this speech in verse 35. First he goes historical. He says, man, let's just do a history lesson. You remember not long ago, there was this guy with a really unfortunate name, uh, named Feudus. 
Uh, he, anybody that's named Theudas should not assume they're supposed to lead anything, okay? Theudas rose up and he claimed to be somebody and a number of men joined him and he was killed and, and, and it came to nothing. And then Judas, the Galilean, he, he rose up when the census was happening. You men remember this? And then he perished and all followed him were scattered. So, so men, keep away from these guys. Keep away from them. Because if, if, if this is just man-made, just like those other men, it, it'll fail. But if it's of God, you might even be found opposing God. Now, this is really surprising because the reader knows. Again, irony works in the Bible because the reader knows something that the, the actors in the drama itself don't really know. That's, that's how irony functions. It, it's how, how it functions in all kinds of ways. We, we know the truth behind what Gamaliel is saying. Look, if... if if this is of God, it will fail. What we know, because we're reading, and the readers of Acts were reading, many, many, many years later, we're knowing, well, it's not going to fail. It's not going to fail. So I, you don't have to put the if, Gamaliel. But in this story, he puts the if. He seems to be recommending kind of a passive fatalism. He's saying, guys, don't make a big deal out of it. If it's of man, it'll fail. If it's of God, if, big if. You might even be found opposing God. What he doesn't do, and here's where the surprise continues, what he doesn't do is acknowledge the fact that, look, if it is of God, shouldn't we be joining it? That seems to totally pass over his mind. Actually, his disciple Paul probably had a much more mature way of thinking about it. Look, it, it, we can't take a middle road here. Gamaliel is the ultimate middle road man. Now, God uses that in this story to deliver the apostles because for some ridiculous reason, the Sanhedrin is convinced. Oh, good point. We'll just back off and we'll watch these men fail. But we have to do something so we'll beat them on the way out. But somehow, God uses this sort of moderating passivity to deliver them from men who wanted to kill them and they leave with only a beating. But they wanted to kill them. They were split open in rage. They're like, okay, you've, you've convinced us. We don't want to oppose God. We'll just take the chance of just beating the men who might be representing him. That won't be so bad. We'll just beat them. That'll be good. And then we'll let them go. That way we're kind of covering our bets here. Worst thing we did was beat God's messengers. Not so bad. Best case, we're just beating men who are going to fade anyway. So he kind of tones them down. He doesn't remove all their rage. He tones it down. He creates this actually absurd middle position for the leaders of Israel. If it is of God, you, you'll be opposing God. And he doesn't ask the question that Paul or Saul answered very clearly. We have to make a choice. We have to make a choice. Join them or kill them. There is no middle choice for the people of God. They're either heretics that should be rejected the way the people in the desert were rejected when they rejected God, or they're faithful people, in which case we better pay attention and listen to what they're saying about Jesus. Gamaliel skips all of that and says, just be passive. But it works. Somehow it works, and God uses it, and the apostles are delivered from what appears to be certain death once again. God can use even the absurdity of a passive leader who's operating in fatalistic terms to deliver his apostles when their own logic is absurd. So the last time, what does he do? Angelic deliverance. This time, what does he do? He uses this absurd, passive, moderating leader of teacher to convince the men to chill out. And then the apostles just slink away, safe from death again. What's the point of these two different snapshots? Look, God, God's not limited to one way of pushing his gospel forward. But the point is, his power will push the gospel forward. It's, it's valuable for us, too. Because sometimes we like the, the big miraculous. I like the first half of the chapter. I mean, people getting healed and, and angels breaking through prisons. I like that part. I don't like the kind of subtle, almost too hard to see. Really? That it was just a technicality? What, what does it matter? Our God is able to push his gospel forward. That, that's the point in Acts. Look, God, God moves in mysterious ways. He moves through Gamaliel. And the other surprise about Gamaliel is in his sort of equivocation, he's actually communicating the absolute truth. 
And the reader can insert the since into his sentence. Since it is of God, verse 39, you will not be able to overthrow them. That's how the church would read this in light of 30 more years of church history and Paul evangelizing the entire Mediterranean world. They would read this and say, since, oh since, since it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. And indeed it is the case that in opposing this community, you are opposing God. Because God is at work in one organization in the world to... to proclaim his gospel and build his kingdom. And this message of Jesus is the center of that work. And you must not oppose it. Because if you oppose it, you are opposing God. Incredibly valuable. Surprising perspective. Last surprising perspective that's present in this snapshot is down there in verse 41. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. You want to notice that word order, the Christ is Jesus. It it, it was not difficult to convince a Jew that there was a Christ. It was not difficult to convince a Jew that there was a Jesus. What was difficult was to convince a Jew that the Christ, the Messiah, everything we had come to believe and hope in was this human individual who had died on a cross. The deity of the Messiah was much easier to convince people of. The glory of him, the heavenly majesty of him. What was difficult was to say, that heavenly majestic figure from Daniel 7, that figure was that person bleeding and dying and expiring on a cross. Very difficult. And that's what they were proclaiming. Trusting that the gospel was able to transform the perspectives of people who hear it. And they rejoice, it says, that they were counted worthy to suffer. This passage, what it basically is doing is it reaches into our hearts to the degree that they've been conformed by the perspective of this culture, and it turns it around. It takes the upside down way of thinking that we absorb with every email and every show and every conversation and billboard and watch. We're just absorbing a certain way that the world works, a certain perspective. What looks like powerful, it is powerful, is powerful. What, what looks like it's important, is important. Physical things are more important than spiritual things. That's every day, which is absorbing. So protect yourself. You have to guard your own future. You shouldn't risk pain. You should love comfort. You should love ease. Everything should be about your security. Just lift it, lift it, lift it, lift it. And the Bible comes in and says, no, upside down. That's, that's the wrong way to think. That's the wrong way to think because God is actually all powerful. God can push his gospel forward even when you seem vulnerable, even when you seem weak, even when you're facing the rage of his enemies. Even then, God can reveal his power and he can reveal it in your heart so that you can have a heart so set on the kingdom of God that even suffering and pain and difficulty is counted as an honor because it was done in Jesus name and brothers and sisters we can cultivate that heart even when we're not experiencing the kind of intense persecution that they were one day we might but we can cultivate that upside down kingdom heart right now it it, it happens when someone sins against you and rather than raging at them you choose to count it an honor to love where you are not being loved it happens when you would rather be distant from someone in the church because they are annoying and obnoxious and instead to love and care for them in a way that would demonstrate the love of Jesus those are like little moments where we're reflecting the truth of this passage that the sake of the name is worth any kind of sacrifice and cost it's demonstrated when When we give to the church, because we're saying for the sake of the name, I will suffer whatever loss I need to suffer. It's demonstrated when people go on church plants across thousands of miles and say goodbye to friends and family and dear ones and familiar surroundings and say, for the sake of the name, I will suffer any loss because his name is worth it and his gospel is going forward. It, it, It happens when people are tired and fatigued at the end of a long day of work and they say, for the sake of the name, I will suffer further fatigue and go to my small group and encourage those that are there because I want to build up his kingdom and his kingdom is worth even further fatigue and difficulty. It's worth encouraging people who despise you. It's worth loving people who don't forgive you. It's worth evangelizing even when you lose your job or reaching out even when your neighbor thinks you're weird. That truth that the sake of the name should dominate our life because we trust that the gospel is going forward and God will give us power. That should shape us 
because we want to be like this early church. And then when the moment comes that we suffer deeply, we'll just be continuing the same pattern. The church prayed when Peter and John alone were arrested that God would allow them to be bold in the face of potential suffering. And then when they faced the threat of death, they were prepared to rejoice when all they received was a beating. Confidence and joy and exhilaration in the forward motion of the gospel cleanses us from being more excited about our own security and comfort and personal possessions and well-being. Part of what Acts is doing, it's, it's, it's trying to give us a taste for the things that should really excite us. It's trying to give us an appetite for the stuff we should really be excited about. It's trying to cleanse us from the t- kind of uh, addictions and cravings that cling so closely to our soul and make it really hard to be rejoicing when we're suffering for Jesus. It's, it's trying to give us a vision for a much more exciting and joyful future on the road with the glorious advancing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it's, that's what it's doing. It's communicating this to us one story at a time. Inviting us to view our lives as a part of the gospel witness that is attended by the power of God, that confounds the rage of his enemies, that is revealed in supernatural power, and shows the surprising perspective of a glorified Savior who died for sinners. Brothers and sisters, this is what our life is about. And it's a glorious thing because God is behind it. 100% in his divine power. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this day and for this story, these stories that communicate about your power. Lord, power in moments where we're seeing abundant revival, power in moments of, of supernatural healing, power in moments to endure suffering and rejoice. Lord, in all the different ways that you move, You are revealing your power at work through those who are loyal to Jesus Christ and proclaim his gospel. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would make our church a bold and courageous witness for your gospel. I pray we would preach to those who persecute us. I pray we would love one another as a demonstration of the work of the gospel in our hearts. That we rejoice, Lord, in suffering, even little moments of suffering and big moments of suffering as being worthy because they are for the sake of your name. Advance the gospel, Lord. Advance the gospel through this church. Advance the gospel through conversations. Advance the gospel through the witness of the community. Advance the gospel in the face of suffering. Advance the gospel in the face of rage. Advance your gospel by your power. Do this among us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.